In the first two editions of this basket case Corvette rebuild, I spent all my time tearing things apart. Engine, body off the chassis, you name it. Finally, we're gonna start making stuff look good. It is hot out here. It's like Satan's armpit. I have spent the past few days videoing some really cool engine builds, so I don't know when this will come out compared to those published dates, but I finally got some time to myself again, and I'm gonna start back on the Project Corvette. Now, the last time I got the body off of the frame, and so now I have options. I've got the floorboards to put into the body, but I don't really wanna do that yet. What I really wanna do is mess with the frame a little bit. I know it's gonna need some repairs, and I also wanna get the suspension off of it so I can go ahead and start ordering up parts. Time to have some fun. Here's what remained after I pulled the engine and then the body in the first two videos. And no, it ain't pretty. But honestly, this is kind of a best case scenario when you're talking about 42 years worth of road wear and tear. These shims are used to level the body on the chassis. So I was careful to bag each set separately and mark their location so I can get them back into the same position when I'm ready to drop the body back on. Hopefully that's not too far in the future. When I was trying to pull the body, I had one bolt where the head was so rusty and rounded, I had to grind the head off and leave the shaft still in the frame. To get it out, I just sanded nice wide flats in both sides and then used an adjustable to spin her out. This little guy was down in the driver's side kick panel and with the body out of the way, working with it got a whole lot easier. Then it's time to get to work pulling everything. What's annoying here is that by 1980, GM had fully switched over to metric fasteners on most of its cars, at least on the body and chassis. But that's definitely not the case on the Corvette. They seem to have just thrown fasteners out of the bolt bin at it with no rhyme or reason as to what gets a metric bolt or an Imperial. I guess because we're getting down to the last years of the C3 model. So anyhow, I was constantly grabbing the wrong socket or wrench, slowing down progress. A lot of this stuff I already know is junk. So things like the fuel and brake lines went right into the old garbage bin. But there's a lot of stuff I know I'll eventually be replacing that I still bagged up and labeled. At least that way, if I need to, I can refer back and see what size bolts were used and things like that. Major systems like the rear end I just pulled out in chunks. I'll have to come back later and tear it all the way down and see what can be reused and what needs to be replaced. For the front suspension, I just broke loose the upper ball joint from the top of the spindle to release the pressure on the spring. But on both sides of the car, the nut on top of the shock shaft was all galled up, so the entire shaft unthreaded from the shock body. After the suspension was out of the way, I just cut the top off the shaft with a reciprocating saw and let it drop out the bottom. I wasn't planning on saving the shocks anyway. After 42 years, the body mounts are pretty well rotten too. So that's it. The chassis is bare and there's a pretty solid coating of surface rust everywhere. There also seems to be no sign of any undercoating left at all, just rust and metal. I'm also realizing the chassis is filled with curves and pockets that are going to be pretty difficult to reach. On the underside, there are also several spots that are just eaten out by rust. This one is the worst. It's just behind the driver's side front wheel where the tire has been throwing up grit and moisture off the road. Still, I figured I'd give it a shot, so I dragged it out onto the driveway where I could have at it with a coarse stripping disc on the grinder. Ah, uh, it didn't go well, mainly because I live in the south and right now it's August. Check out those lovely sweat stains. You don't see that on Chip Foose. This is my personal beachhead and my battle against rust, and it's not going well. I think I'm going to call in the cavalry. It is hot out here. It's like Satan's armpit. And this is the Calvary. That's Tim Kinley, 
and Billy Burris of Kenley Burris Blasting. Tim's the one on the left. A race car building friend of mine recommended these guys and they came to me and blasted the chassis in the woods beside my house. The material they're using is glass beads and it did a great job of stripping the frame down to the bare metal. The glass material is also safer than using traditional sand which can cause a nasty condition called silicosis when you breathe in the tiny sand particles that inevitably are floating around in the air from being shot out of the blaster at really high rates of speed. So this is a decision I'm not going to regret. Tim and Billy of Kenley Burst Blasting have been here for like 10 minutes and they're already halfway through the frame. Now I've been messing with this thing for a couple hours and I've already killed like a nine dollar shipping pad. So it's gonna be more money, but it's definitely better. Plus, there was no way I could get into all those little nooks and crannies that they can. This is exciting. Also, I'm just a big fan of not keeling over from heat stroke. That's for chumps. Now, obviously, if you live in a neighborhood, your homeowners association is probably gonna pitch a fit if you have a crew come out and blast a rusty old chassis in your driveway. But I'm lucky to be a hick living out in the middle of nowhere, so that's what I'm doing. I'll put a link to Kenley Burris Blasting in the description for this video. They're both car guys, and it was really fun to meet them. Okay, so we are jumping ahead in time about 48 hours later. And I'm letting you know that because I'm already getting some flash rust on the chassis. I knew it would do that, but I waited too long. That's on me. That is not on the blasters at all. And by the way, Kenley Burris blasters, if you are in the Charlotte, North Carolina area or something like that, I definitely recommend those guys. It was well worth it for me to pay the $600 that it costs to blast the chassis, cross members, some other stuff. They came to me, uh, they knew exactly what they were doing. They had it done in a morning. I didn't have to drag the chassis anywhere. And like mama always wanted me to do when I was a kid, they even cleaned up after themselves. Billy and Tim really did an excellent job with the blaster. I mean, there's no way I could have reached into areas like that with a wire wheel on a grinder. So I'm really glad they came in and took care of the job for me. But what's amazing to me, now that the rust is off, is just how bad the welds are on here. This blows my mind. And it's not just the splatter quality of the welds, they're even leaving wire everywhere. Is this normal? So this is a 1980 model chassis, which means it was probably welded up in 79 or so. And I've already started grinding on some of these welds. Here's another look at a bad spot. And I know they didn't have robots and everything back then, but surely they had people that could weld better than this. Is this a Monday morning chassis when the weld crew just came in hung over or something? For those of you that have been through this before, leave me a comment, please. Let me know, have you seen this on your Corvette chassis or other early model GM chassis? It just blows my mind. So the next step for me is to go in and do some repairs and some welding. I've heard that you can really stiffen up the chassis by welding up all the areas where the stitch welds didn't hit. So that's what I'm gonna to try to do. I've also got some repairs to make. They're mostly on the bottom of the chassis. So once I get all this ready, I'll flip it over and I will show you what I'm talking about. Here is a look at the underside. Welds are pretty nasty on this side too. And here's the worst of the rust right here. And it's pretty thin, I think. So I'm gonna need to make a patch panel that's pretty large to fix that. And that's not the only spot that's bad with rust. I've got rust over here too in these spots. I need to clean that up. 
Holy cow, check out the porosity on that weld. Blech. And then here's something interesting. Here's a crack right here. I don't see any wreck damage or anything, but we do have a crack that's gonna need to be taken care of. And I'm kicking myself for not putting some kind of protectant on this earlier. The flash rust is bad, but I'm gonna POR 15 it so it doesn't care about little bits of rust like that anyway. The rear clip doesn't look too bad, but still plenty of grinding to do. Back at it. After grinding off as much of the weld splatter and other nastiness that I could get to, I set to work cutting out the rot on the underside of the chassis. So here's what I finished cutting out. A little bit bigger than I thought it was going to be, but I kept chasing back thin metal. I wanted to get the uh, good thick metal all the way around. It probably will not be beautiful when I get done with it, but it'll be solid. And here's the other bad spot I'm fixing to start on. This in the back corner on the passenger side. And maybe some of you fabricators with 20 years experience have a better idea than I do. Uh, but there's all these spots right here that are rusted out and real thin. It's right up against that weld. So I think I'm going to go right down here and back again this way. But this right here is up against that gusset and I don't know what I'm gonna do there. I'm probably gonna come just stop here, maybe plate this. Because again, I've got it over here as well as a thin spot. And I definitely don't wanna go cutting in through here and trying to patch all that back. So I'm definitely gonna plate over this part right here and go all the way down to here. I'm guessing, yeah, it does look bad. But since I've started this project, I've talked to several Corvette restorers and they said they have seen a whole lot worse. So I just need to be thankful, I guess. And here's the second big hole I've got to make a patch for. Okay, so obviously the next step is to fill those holes I made in the chassis with some sheet metal. Now I picked up some good 11 gauge from a local metal shop. And these were drops from a previous job I was able to pick up on the cheap. But still, metal is still expensive. So I don't want to waste any of it. I'm going to make some patterns ahead of time to know exactly what shape I need. Now this is just inexpensive poster board I picked up for like 97 cents a sheet at Target. Cut out a couple pieces and we'll be ready to rock. So here is the hole I'm going to want to fill. Now instead of trying to trace it or guess the shape or anything like that, I just take a rubber mallet, something with a malleable face, place my paper over the edge, hold it steady so it will not move on you, and then just tap around the edges to make your form. Now we know exactly the size hole we need to fill. Now I just go and cut out the pattern based on the image created by the hammer. As I test out the pattern, you can probably see it ain't perfect, but that's not a big deal. Here's one area where I have a bit too much of a gap but that can be fixed simply by taping another piece of poster board over that edge to get the dimensions correct. Once I've confirmed the patterns all fit, I can go back to my work table, lay them out on the piece of metal I plan to use for the patch panels, and use an extra wide permanent marker to trace out the outlines. Really, the marker is only extra wide so I can see it better. This is the point where I'm really wishing I own a bandsaw, but I don't, so I'll just have to make do with what I have. The sawzall, or reciprocating saw, whatever you want to call it, makes quick work of the cut, 
but that wide blade doesn't like to follow curves or change angle at all after the cut's been started. I also have an air saw that I picked up from the Hazard Freight, but that thing is junk. So when the Sawzall couldn't do the job, I mostly depended on one of two cutoff saws. The air powered die grinder with a cutoff disc is a staple. But a while back, I also happened to pick up this Milwaukee 12 volt cutoff tool. It was okay, really nothing great, but I was just using the smaller two amp hour batteries. Once I smartened up and switched to the more powerful four or six amp high output batteries, this baby really rocks. The bigger batteries give it a lot more torque and cutting power, and I'm really finding a lot more uses for it now. Anyhow, just a tip for you. The old fabricator's adage says something like, it's a lot easier to take away metal than it is to add it back. So as I'm cutting out the patches, I'm always trying to stay on the fat side of the line rather than cut too thin. I have the patch panels cut out, but I also already know they're gonna to be too big for the holes. So I just mark the areas where material needs to be removed and get to work on it on the grinding wheel. This is the tedious part of the process because I don't wanna to go too far. So I grind a little and check, and then grind some more and check again. When I start getting close, I switched over for the detail work with a 90 degree die grinder with a sanding disc attached. Finally, I've got the patch panel where it'll fit in the hole in the chassis, but as you can probably see, I've got a couple areas with some pretty decent gaps. Still, I decided to go for it. So I cleaned up any scale on the metal, hit the underside with a high zinc primer to at least provide it with some protection against rust, and then tack welded it into place. Looking back on it, I should have broken the patch panel into maybe three smaller sections. That would have given me three simpler shapes and helped me get tighter gaps. As it is, I had to spend too much time trying to bridge gaps with the welder. That's definitely not the best way to go, but live and learn. Welding isn't something I do very often, and unlike riding a bike, it's definitely a perishable skill. You've got to keep practicing to keep your skills sharp. So don't look to me for any welding advice because honestly, I'm not qualified to give it. I know I got good penetrations and my weld will stick, but those weld beads are ugly. Next up come the straps I want to use to strengthen the area between the rear cross member and the frame rails. The problem is they're about a quarter of an inch of height difference. So after welding the inner edge, I had to use a big C clamp to bend the strap down enough to get it tight against the frame rail. Once that's nice and tight, I can weld it solid and then move on to the sides. Then, after I got the patch panels welded in and the ugliest portions of the beads ground down, I started welding up the chassis. From the factory, the chassis is stitch welded, which leaves gaps where the frame isn't welded at all. Now, I've been told that welding up all the seams nice and solid will help stiffen the chassis. And this is especially critical around those spring pockets, and I believe it because that's where I've already found a crack. So, while it's all right here in the open and easy to reach, I figured it's the perfect time to get it done. And here is where I need to confess a screw up. My plan when welding up the frame was to skip around so that the heat isn't allowed to build up in any one area and potentially warp the metal. But once I started, I got into a groove and I completely forgot about it. I don't think it's going to be a big deal, but I wish I had done this part correctly. By the way, welding up the chassis took a pretty decent amount of time and I was finally getting back into my groove with the welder. Practice may not make perfect every time, but at least in my case, practice does make presentable. At this point, the chassis is ready for a rust protective coating. A little behind the scenes note here is that I'm also working on a story for my friends at All Chevy Performance Magazine, testing out a kit from POR15. And that's what I'm going to be using here. So look for my story in a couple months. All Chevy Performance is available both online and, if you're old school, on the newsstand.
Of course, it isn't much of a test if the POR15 is used in ideal conditions. And that's exactly what the fully bead blasted frame is. Just about anything will do well when all the conditions are perfect. So I decided to also try the stuff on something a little bit crustier just to give the POR15 more of a challenge. So I pulled out the two upper control arms which are covered in rust and grime. Unfortunately, I also needed to remove the ball joints. From the factory, Chevrolet riveted the ball joints to the control arm and they are a bit of a pain to get out because you just can't unbolt them. Different people have different methods for getting the rivets out, but what worked best for me was to grind the head of the three rivets on top of each control arm until they're flat. Then, using a 7 30 seconds drill bit, I drill out the shaft of the rivet just enough to release the tension so I can knock them out with a punch. And then I very carefully put them into the never gonna use them again storage container. With the ball joints out of the way, I just kind of, sort of, really quickly cleaned them up using a wire wheel on an angle grinder. Really, all I did was knock the very worst of the dirt and the rust off. As you can see, here's a comparison between a steel untouched control arm with the one I just finished hitting with the wire wheel. It's better, but by no means would I call it great. I did the second one to the same mediocre level. This will be a much tougher test for the POR15. Here's what I'm going to be using on the chassis and control arms. This all came from POR15 in a kit. It's a gallon of cleaner degreaser, a gallon of metal prep, and two quarts of POR15 in semi-gloss black. They also sell it in gloss black, silver, gray, and clear if you're interested. The guys at POR15 told me this should be more than enough to handle the chassis and several other components. Now let's be clear. POR15 isn't paint, but just like a paint job, getting quality results depends much more on doing all the cleaning and prep work than it does when you're actually applying the stuff. I've heard people gripe about POR15 before, saying that it doesn't last or it flakes back off and stuff like that. But in my experience, it's almost always because they didn't properly prep the surface to be coated before brushing on the POR15. POR stands for paint over rust, but it doesn't mean paint over dirt or paint over loose rust. In order to properly adhere to the metal and create a protective barrier against moisture and oxidation so that the metal can't rust anymore, the stuff has to be able to make a good bond to the metal. And that's where the prep comes in. I poured the cleaner degreaser into a squirt bottle I picked up from Lowe's and began spraying down the chassis two cross members, a front bumper support, and the two upper control arms. POR15 recommends thoroughly wetting whatever it is you plan to coat with their cleaner degreaser. Then wait 15 minutes and hose it off with clean water. That's not too difficult, so that's what I did. Also, they don't want the cleaner drying on the metal, so if you see it starting to dry before the 15 minutes is up, just spray it some more with the stuff. It actually did seem to help with the leftover gunk on the control arms. Then I dried it off and repeated the process with the metal etch. Like before, POR15 recommends that it's allowed to sit on the metal for 15 minutes and you don't allow it to dry before washing off with clean water. After that step was done, I tried to dry everything off as thoroughly as I could and then allowed the chassis to sit overnight. Okay, just FYI, it's the next day. But yesterday I did get the chassis degreased I applied the POR15 etch and then I had family time, which was awesome. So now I'm back and I'm actually ready to apply the real deal and get going with that. So POR15 is a coating that actually makes like a shell, unlike an enamel or something like that, that's totally waterproof and will not let the rust get back going again. And oops, hold on. Forgot my gloves. One of the tricks of this stuff that makes it unique is it actually dries by absorbing moisture, which seems a little bit counterintuitive. But unlike regular in paints, which uses volatile chemicals that evaporate to dry, this actually pulls moisture in and creates that shell like I'm talking about. So if you ever get it on your skin, POR15 recommends getting it off right away because it'll actually pull moisture out of your skin and then be stuck there for like a week or two until your skin actually flakes off. You can't get it off with lacquer thinner or anything after it dries. So gloves are definitely recommended. 
Now, I just went with the chassis black. Let's get this stirred up real good. This is just a one part mixture, so there's no accelerator or anything to mix in. And now I'm definitely gonna have to be on the ball with this stuff. POR 15 actually recommends using this when conditions are below 70% humidity because like I said, it does absorb moisture out of the air. But here in North Carolina, we don't get below 70% humidity until November. And so we just can't wait on that. So we're gonna take a couple precautions here. First of all, gonna just pour it into the cup as I need it and keep the rest of it in the can. Hopefully to keep it away from the moisture. And then I'm gonna get right to it. Notice that the chassis has gone from gray to a motley brown sort of color. That's a result of the metal etch. It's actually supposed to do that. Okay, so here we go. POR 15 recommends two light coats, which is what we're gonna to try to do. But I also need to hurry because like I said, it dries with moisture and today is as typical, a very humid day. So I'm gonna just hustle on through. Now, the problem if you try to do too thick of a coat, they said, is that it can leave brush marks, which I'm not really too worried about. So I may try to do maybe on the thicker side of thin for this, maybe. We'll see how it goes. And I am realizing there is a whole lot of chassis here that needs to get painted. Henry Pace, I could use some help. Also, as a product that forms a hard shell that totally encases the metal and any rust that may still be on it, this stuff is surprisingly thin when it's still in liquid form. I'm not the guy you're ever gonna wanna hire as a painter since patience is not one of my better character traits. So it didn't take me long to realize that I was dripping POR 15 everywhere and needed to put down a ground cover. Would have been a lot easier had I thought to do this ahead of time. POR 15 recommends when using their product that either you use a respirator or apply it in a well-ventilated area. So, as you can see in this shot, I've raised the garage doors. And what you can't see is just outside the frame, I've got a fan blowing fresh air into the shop. The recommended process is to apply the first coat, sort of thin, let the POR 15 dry until it gets tacky, and then apply a second thin coat. And remember, the drying time is not affected by heat. It's determined by humidity. Earlier, I mentioned that one of the main mistakes people make when using POR 15 is not adequately cleaning all the loose rust and grime off whatever piece of metal they're working on. A second common mistake is applying the stuff and leaving it unprotected on areas of a car that are gonna be hit by the sun on a regular basis. Even though the POR 15 is impervious to water and it's really hard to scratch or wear off, it is, however, susceptible to the UV rays in sunlight. If you leave it exposed for too long, it'll turn chalky on you. Now, the good news is that the solution is simple. Just add a top coat of something. You can use about any type of paint you like as long as it isn't clear. And POR 15 also offers several products that'll work very well. But since the chassis and cross members I'm coating will be underneath the car, UV exposure isn't a concern for me, so I won't be applying a top coat. When you're old like I am, the reading glasses definitely help when you're trying to paint black. Now I'm not sure if you can tell from the time lapse video, but my whole plan to do two light coats lasted about two minutes. Um, as I painted all these dips and divots and angles and corners, and I just got worried about making sure everything covered. So POR 15 says that if you paint it too thick, you can just leave brush marks. And I'm not really too concerned about brush marks. So I'm going with the gob it on thick and let's see how it does. It's not the recommended way to do it, but we'll find out. Whew. Not a painter. Painting is not my craft. So many little hidden spots to cover. All 
although I got a little too impatient with the chassis, I was able to show a little restraint when it came to the upper control arms and did follow the two coat process like POR 15 recommends. And after giving them time to thoroughly dry, the results are honestly really impressive. The two coats smoothed out any brush strokes and the control arms look really good. Plus the shell the POR 15 creates seems to be pretty tough. Of course, only time will tell. The real test will be my planned long-term use and abuse on the Corvette. All right, so here we are a few days later, just to give the POR 15 time to cure and it's done. What do you think? I like it. Now, of course, it's not perfect. There's several areas where there's runs from the POR 15, but that's my own fault for being in too big of a hurry and just slapping it on willy nilly. I'll just grind them down if I want to and not if I don't. This is not a show car by any means, but it's well protected from the elements, both moisture and road grit kicked up by the tires. And I'm ready to move on to the next stages. Thanks again for watching. Please leave a comment and a like if you enjoyed the video and we'll see you next time.